In light of uh, the events from yesterday afternoon, it would uh, benefit us greatly just to go to the Lord in, in prayer at this time. Uh, Lord, uh, we come before you, and uh, first and foremost, uh, we are thankful that you uh, spared the life of former President Donald Trump by mere millimeters, Lord, just a, something as uh, providential as uh, turning ahead, hey God, so uh, we do pray for a, a speedy and, and quick recovery. And, and Lord, we also pray for the, the family, uh, the families of uh, the family of the one individual that uh, deceased, and then also the families of um, those individuals that were critically and severely injured. And, and God, uh, allow this uh, to be a reminder uh, of the presence of evil in this world, Lord, allow this to be a reminder uh, that we as followers of Christ are, are to be on our knees in prayer, uh, prayer for our country, uh, prayer for our elected leaders, uh, prayer that you would indeed remain and continue to be sovereign over all, that the whole world would know this, Lord, that our country would repent and turn to you, uh, Lord, that this would spark uh, some sort of revival or some uh, sort of just leaning more and more into you, Jesus. And God, we ask that you just be over as you already are. Not that we need to ask this, that you be over this upcoming election, uh, that biblical truth would rise to the surface. That, that leaders would not acquiesce or uh, would not concede to what you have said, what you have decreed, and what you have declared in your holy word. And allow us not to be ignorant on these matters, but may we educate ourselves and know how we are to vote. And God, we are thankful that through all of this, you are indeed seated on your throne high above all, sovereign. God, you bring up kings and kingdoms and you bring down kings and kingdoms. And Lord, we can rest in that. And Lord, we are not praying and we are not electing a Savior. We already have one. And His name is Jesus Christ. And so God, we pray for our country right now. And we pray that we would be more diligent in prayer, Lord, that your name would remain supreme with much fame, with much glory, with much renown. We commit these things to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah, there's uh, lots to think about, and, and may that even be a correction for some of us to be more mindful of how we are to uh, be praying, uh, praying for, for our country, praying for our elected individuals, praying for us as we navigate things as, as well, praying for us as we endure this uh, wretched heat, right? And so um, for, I, I consider myself somewhat of a tweener, probably more on the newer side of things. We've been out here for nine years, but it is kind of funny. People come, I didn't know it got this hot out here. And so, yeah, it does get very hot. Usually we just don't get this type of weather until August, so we got a little bit early. Uh, but I don't know how you have been staying cool uh, this past week, but you better figure it out because we've got another week to come of these uh, above 100 degree temps. And so there's lots of ways one could stay cool. I don't know where you get ice blocks around here, but this guy figured out a way to get an ice block and cozy up next to it. That's one way of staying cool. Um, this next one, probably not the wisest thing. He, you know, strapped a fan to his forehead. And so, uh, not, not, you know, I don't think the elevator goes to the top floor there. Um, <laughs> probably not the safest thing. And, and this guy, I don't know if he knows, but he's actually in a garbage can. Gross. Uh, my son Mason told me that this is commonplace in England, unbeknownst to me. Any, anyone concede that, Paragos? Do they do this in England? I, you haven't heard of it. So anyhow, we, we don't know, but this guy, um, I, I, I would think there's some probably better ways to stay cool. And then finally, any Lord of the Rings fans out there? Come on, raise them up. Raise him up. All right. Okay. Now, anybody in here strongly dislike Lord of the Rings? 
Strongly dislike Lord of the Rings? Wow, there's a lot more first service. I mean, that's okay. Uh, that's okay. My wife's one of them. The Lord will judge you. Um, it's all good. But I, I ran across this, and for those of you that know, they had to, these little hobbits with furry feet, which is really strange and weird, had to throw this, this ring into, you know, this mountain where it would melt again. I'm not even going to explain it. You could read it for yourself. Um, my recommendation is that we all just find a place with a solid air conditioning, okay? But the most important thing is this, that we all be steadfast in prayer, that the air conditioning here at Eagle High School remains running to its fullest potential. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. And so, but great job hanging with us. If you came back after last week, I wanted to commend you because we covered a lot of ground, but not really. We only covered one verse, so just one. Uh, Romans 5.12. Now, that was not my original intention when talking about original sin, but there was just so much to talk about uh, regarding this and such a great deal of discussion. And so, now, we said this, even though Paul, he said so much in just one verse, so much can be said in so few words. We use the analogy of this is as if a large door A large door is swinging on a very small hinge. And that's what we see at times in Scripture. We see this aspect of these large, colossal, theological truths, tenets, really swinging on maybe one or two verses in Scripture. And that's what we saw last week when talking about this um, topic of original sin. And so so today we are continuing on in, in chapter 5, and we're going to be taking verses 13 through 17. So part two of our sermon, Death in Adam and Life in Christ. And so now to bring us up to speed, and I would recommend that if you didn't catch last week, in order for today to make a little bit more sense, I would encourage you to try to catch last week. But we talked about these three transactional imputations. Now, this word imputation or to impute means to credit or to deposit or even to charge something to someone. It's almost as if it's a, a bank debit or credit. Okay, it's either being deposited or taken out. And so, so with that being said, it could be very good or it could be very bad. And so we talked about three transactional imputations last week regarding our salvation, regarding our life in Christ. Now, uh, the first two that we talked about are overwhelmingly good. The good by far outweighs uh, the bad. They're very positive in nature. And this is the obvious one where Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And it has been imputed to us as a result of of our sins being imputed to him on the cross. So our sins are charged to Christ. He pays the penalty, the wrath of God on the cross. And as a result of that, Christ's righteousness is credited, it is deposited, it is imputed to us. And that is very good news. And this is uh, overwhelmingly good. But the third imputation that we talked about is negative in nature, overwhelmingly bad. And so this is original sin being introduced to all of mankind through one man's disobedience, Adam eating of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. And so we talked about that last week, and sure enough, I had two individuals come up to me and say, you know that it was Eve that gave Adam the fruit. And obviously those two individuals were men, right? But it was this original sin was charged to Adam. And when we say original sin, it isn't the specific act of eating of the forbidden fruit, but what it is, it is the effect the consequence and the result of that one sin cascading throughout the entirety of mankind. And so that's really what we're talking about here. And what we really talked about and what we um, leaned into was this, is that two of these imputations are antithetical mirrors. And just that word antithetical, this is where we get the word antithesis, is that they're just polar opposites. But a mirror being the same. And so what we're saying, they're polar opposites, but the same. They're similar, but different. So how's that for 
a Yoda statement, right? And so I just referenced Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. Uh, That's going to be the last time some people come back. Uh, But similar but different. And, And this is why objects in this world are compared and contrasted. Compared because we're looking at the similarities. Contrasted because we're looking at the differences. And so this is what um, we're going to be talking about. And then just a, a brief throwback to last week. Whereas last week we looked, at to, we looked at some of these similarities to allow some truths to rise to the surface. First and foremost, if you embrace a historical Jesus that it actually happened, and the righteousness that Christ brought in his life and death and resurrection, then the parallel is that you must also embrace a historical Adam and the sin that affected and infected the entirety of mankind. And so, again, if we embrace a historical, literal view of both of these Adams, Adam and Jesus Christ, then what that does, it has profound implications as far as how we view a literal, a historical, that it actually happened view of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Not a symbolic, not an allegorical, not a metaphorical, not a poetic view of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, saying that you can't have it both ways. If you're going to embrace a historical, literal Jesus, then we must embrace a historical and literal view of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so that was one truth that rose to the surface when looking at our similarities, when looking at our comparisons. Now, whereas last week we allowed the similarities to bring about truth, this week we are indeed going to allow these differences, these contrasts, these juxtapositions, if you will, to bring uh, to surface some of these truths. And so I'm going to reread verse 12, which we covered last week, and we are continuing all the way to uh, verse 17. And um, so there's there are these contrasts, 1 in 15, 16, and 17. See if you could uh, see them as we read through this passage, and we'll address them as we continue. So, verse 12 starts, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God in the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so what we're looking at here is dense. And so the book of Romans being Paul's theological masterpiece is dense. And I would just challenge us all. As we continue on through the book of Romans, this is why we preach from an expository fashion, verse by verse, because we don't want to just skim over some things. And this is of great importance as far as our life in Christ is concerned. Because none of us like hanging out at the shallow end of the pool. We all have a lot more fun when we're swimming in the deep end, right? And so if we approach how we view the Word of God, if we look at it from these aspects, and some, you might hear the word theology, and you're like, yes, this is me, this is maybe why I'm even here. And then some might actually look at the word theology and say, you know, it's just kind of like, I just want to know this stuff. And I would just challenge us, where, wherever we're at with that, to continue to strive to swim in 
the deep end. First of all, it's more fun. And second of all, nothing's ever found in the shallow end. The cool stuff's in the deep end. That's where those precious pearls are found. And when we go deep as far as Scripture is concerned, what happens is that deepens our faith. If we stay shallow as far as how we view Scripture, our faith is going to remain shallow. So challenge all of us. Why? Because these are the things that establish a strong framework, a foundation that will not crack amidst the the challenges and upheavals of this world such as yesterday. This is what allows our roots to go deep. And so I would just encourage us when we go through verses such as last week, verses such as today, uh, weeks and months, years, no, just kidding, to come as far as Romans is concerned to, to just really lean in. Maybe it means reading some other things. Maybe it comes, means coming up to me and saying, hey, you know what, I kind of differ in what, you know, you said, and that's okay. I, I appreciate that. Just make sure to back it up with the verse. So, uh, but... <laughs> But I just wanted to just use that disclaimer as far as um, before we jump into these contrasts between Adam and Christ. And so, so with that being said, we see some challenges as far as verses 13 and 14 are concerned. And at the conclusion of verse 12, uh, we see in your Bibles, if you were to look, it's a long dash. And that would be referred to as an M dash. And a little bit more pronounced than a comma. And a little bit more relaxed than parentheses. And yes, I just use adjectives to describe grammatical punctuation, which is really lame and nerdy. But I'm saying this because no punctuation was in the original language. And the translators put punctuations in there specifically to appreciate the emphasis or to appreciate the cadence by what the original writer were speaking. And so this long dash serves, this M dash serves as a break or separation in thought. Okay, and so he doesn't pick this thought back up until we get to verse 18, which we'll be reviewing next week. And so now the reason we see this long dash is because Paul realizes the truth bomb that he just dropped on us in verse 12, and he understands that that profound statement in verse 12 requires some degree of explanation. That sin came into this world to all of mankind through one man, that requires some explanation. So what we arrived at last week, just kind of summarizing the remainder of chapter 5 and specifically verses 18 and 19, which we'll review uh, next week. But we came up with this summarizing statement that provides somewhat of an overview of what we're doing, where we've been, and where we're going as far as the remainder of chapter 5 is concerned. And and that is this. Paul is making a comparison between the first Adam, who through his disobedience ushered in the universal reign of sin and death, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who through his obedience ushered in the universal reign of righteousness and life. And so, so... We have to, uh, just before we jump into these contrasts, Paul here in verses 13 and 14 is backing up this original statement on original sin. And so he, as he does so often throughout Scripture, he is already one step ahead of us. He's already answering the question before we've actually formulated the question in our own mind. And that question would be, How could sin have originated through Adam if there was no law that existed for one to break? How could sin have originated through Adam if there was no law that existed for one to break? Because why? Because the Ten Commandments had not yet been given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And what about all the people that existed prior to this? How could they be sinning if there was no sovereign or governing rule in which they were either to adhere to or if they were to actually break. And so Paul answers this question by leading out with this response in verse 13. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression 
of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now, that it's challenging because it, it states this. It say, states sin was not counted. It states even though there was no transgressions against the law. Why? Because the law did not exist. So how would one break the law if there was nothing to break again? But he doubles back on this statement by answering the question, making it perfectly clear at the beginning of 13, that sin existed. It indeed was in the world before the law was given. And also the consequence of sin also existed with the consequence of sin as we talked about last week being death. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. And so as we learned last week, a physical death is a byproduct of sin. That sin was present prior to the law. It states that it reigned from Adam to Moses. And so even though that Adam lived to be 930 years old, he still died. And all of mankind, that's the guarantee of this carnal life, is that we will all face death. And in, in addition... Regarding this culpability prior to the law, if we remember all the way back to chapter 2, even those who have sinned without the law, even those who are unaware of the law, still fall under the indictment of the law. Why? Because what does it say in Romans 2? It, it states that God has written the law on the conscience of every human heart. And so we essentially violate our conscience because this law has been placed on it every time we sin. So to review those verses, verse 2.12, For all who have ever sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And for all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Dropping down to 15. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. And so, now, that's not what today's message is about, but to summarize this, so we could maybe navigate through verses 13 and 14 to arrive at these contrasts, to summarize this, to reinforce last week and to reinforce where we are going this week, man is guilty under original sin. Not only because of his sinful acts, as we know, known as righteous, no, not one, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but also because of his sinful or sin nature. Now, I know that could be a challenging, that could be a conflicting. There are many viewpoints as far as that is concerned as well. But this is saying that we have a sin nature in which we have been born into. And so verse 14 concludes with a statement that Adam was a type of the one to come. And when he states Adam is a type of one to come, this actually concludes all parallels, all comparisons, all similarities that he has taken the liberty with to compare Jesus Christ to Adam. And now he focuses on these Three contrasts, these three differences, these three juxtapositions. Again, one in 15, one in 16, and one in 17. And what he is doing here, he is allowing these contrasts to be clearly evident in order to allow Jesus Christ, his superiority, his supremacy, him being far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that has been named not only in this age but the one to come he is establishing this huge disparity that exists now he's taken the time to use the similarities to provide truth but now he is taking this big discrepancy to allow Jesus Christ and his preeminence and his glory and his renown to rise to the surface in our hearts our minds and our souls. He's saying, I've used Christ and Adam to convey these initial points, but now you really need to see that there is no comparison between the two. So, the first one, the first contrast we see, Romans 5.15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, 
much more. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And one thing to take notice of here is that he does not use the word sin. Instead, he uses the word trespass. In some of your versions, you you might see the word transgression. And this word trespass in the Greek is paraptime. And paraptime means to transgress or to deviate or to stumble or fall. And, And it's the equivalent of walking along a path and then we find ourselves no longer on that path. That is why we see no trespassing signs. We have trespassed. We have transgressed. We have deviated from the way in which we were supposed to go. And this is what happened with Adam. He, he literally tripped up and fell headlong into this trespass. It wasn't just a mere oversight. He did, and they did the one thing that they are commanded not to ever do. And so I love one commentator's analogy of this. Uh, he basically states, as is, it's as if Adam was the engine of a train. And what took place and what takes place when a train derails, it comes off of the tracks and all of the cars that we are in, we now are careening off of the tracks, off of the bridge, into the ravine, and we are now all a part of this devastating crash, this devastating mess which is taking place. And I feel like this is a vivid analogy of Adam's imputed sin um, being transferred to us. But where does verse 15 start off with? It states, but. But. Thank the Lord for the buts in the Bible. But the free gift, the free gift is not like the trespass. What Paul is saying here is that Christ's one act of obedience that brought forth salvation and the free gift that it provides is immeasurably more than Adam's one act of disobedience that brought forth damnation and the trespass in which we are now a part of. Now, in order to establish this inequality, he uses this phrase, much more. Much more. The free gift of grace, which is much more than Adam's trespass, much more than Adam's transgression. And what we can see from this, and this is the summary of the contrast. And when I read these, I kind of struggled which one to use. When I say, when we say grace delivers us from our trespass, this first contrast, we could also say this, grace is over our trespass, meaning the same thing. This is the first contrast to recognize from our passage today that grace provided through Jesus Christ is so much greater than our imputed trespasses which has been charged from Adam. And then the second contrast that we can observe is found in verse 16. And the free gift is not like, it is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment follows one trespass, this brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Now Paul, again, he uses this phrase, not like. And and what we can appreciate with Paul's rhetoric is he was always very linear and concise and objective. He knows exactly where he wants to take us, and he uses words in accordance to convey what he wants to convey. Previous verse, much more. I don't know what it is in the Greek, and here we see not like. He, he wants us again to really see these differences. And here he wants us to see these differences because there's something very grave that he is trying to highlight here. And oftentimes we have said throughout the book of Romans, we have to step into how bad the bad truly is before we could step into how good the good truly is. And what he wants us to see here as far as the bad is concerned is the grave nature as far as how the Lord views sin. He states, one sin. 
One trespass brings about condemnation. One sin, one trespass brings about judgment. Now, we may retort and say, well, the judgment of the entirety of the human race on just one trespass, one transgression, that seems kind of harsh. And if we remember a couple of the day-to-day analogies that we talked about last week, we talked about, you know, Tim Way getting a red card in Copa America, and because of that, they had to play a man down. They lost that match. They lost the next game. The consequences continued. The head coach of the U.S. men's national team lost his job this past week. And so we could see that there was great consequence from one man's action. We joked around, like, you know, everyone flops in soccer, and he took a swing at the guy's head, and the guy fell. Like, he got dropped by Mike Tyson, but he just barely got his head grazed in there. But but we also talked to basketball lovers, right? It's just kind of like, hey, you're, you know, schmuck of a teammate couldn't make his free throws, and because of that, you've got to run, run 10 more ladders, right? And, and, you know, we've all been there. We've all missed the free throws in practice like that for those who have played basketball. But, yes, yes, the Lord is saying the judgment of the entirety of the human race is based on Adam's sin. Now, and what that means and why that is there, it is to express God's disdain for sin. No sin, no sin is allowed in the presence of God. Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1.13, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Isaiah 59.2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Very significant. Psalm 5, 4. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. You see, God hates sin so much. It only took one sin to condemn all of mankind. One sin to send a human soul to eternal damnation. One sin that allows this separation from Him. The entire world is subject to the judgment. The entire world is subject to condemnation because of Adam's transgressions. It's not fair. It's a little bit borderline nonsensical, but this is what and how the Word of God views this. Again, the beauty. The beauty is found in the contrast. And I want us to really hang with me here. If we look at punishment, punishment is a natural consequence for wrongdoing. If we were to look at it from these verses, judgment and condemnation is a natural consequence for a trespass or a transgression. That actually makes sense. But what doesn't make sense that benefits us exponentially is that a reward is not a natural consequence for wrongdoing. What do we mean by this? Well, justification that we receive deemed righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ, it doesn't make sense that we receive that for a trespass. And so what this does all the more is it just shows off the glory of our salvation. Can you believe that God did this for us through His Son, Jesus Christ? Whereas condemnation is the result of one man's sin, a normal consequence, we instead receive justification. We receive something glorious in spite of what we've done for Christ while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. This is a beautiful and magnificent truth. And this is the whole adage of mercy. Mercy is not getting something that we deserve, and grace is getting something that we don't 
deserve. And this is mercy and grace just compiled into this amazing truth of justification. We are the recipients of this great grace all the more. So much more. Let me read this verse again because there's more. So much more. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And what this means for us are many trespasses, are many transgressions, are many sins. They have all been paid for. All of them paid in full by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There is no partiality. When Jesus Christ says that you are justified, you are deemed righteous, it is all or nothing in this my friend, this Christian is very, very good news. This is the good news of the gospel. And if you're here today, or if you've been in a season where you feel like you are just crushed under the weight of your former sins, a former life, a former season, today you need to be set free. The righteousness of Christ, the imputed righteousness of Christ has set you free once and for all. Do not allow what has taken place in the past to be an obstacle to glory and rejoice in the redemption that you have. Who says it better than Paul himself, who had more reason to say it than anyone else, a persecutor of Christ? So many things, and why do you think in this well-known verse that he says this? Philippians 3, 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but the one thing that I do Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And I would just encourage all of us. Put the past behind. Put a bookend on that. The only reason we need to look at, at our past sins and trespasses and transgressions is to say that I'm never going back there again. The devil wants us to wallow in that, but Christ wants us to live in the freedom in which we've been given. And so this, this is the truth of the contrast. Make no mistake, Christ is greater than Adam, and justification is delivers us from our condemnation. Justification is over our condemnation. And the grand finality of these contrasts that we could glean from and really look to and establish this supremacy, the superiority of Jesus Christ has to do, and we find in verse 17. For if, because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who received the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This contrast, this concludes with the weightiest of contrast because it has to do with matters of life and death. And we talked about this last week in review. It is not just one death that we all must pass through. There are three deaths. There is a spiritual death. Or never becoming spiritually alive. We, we will stay dead. We will never step into the abundant life, the greatest joy of having a life in Christ. A spiritual death, or the one that we all know of and the one that we 
Most of the unbelieving world thinks that they are going to wind up on the right side of when a physical death takes place. That, that basically just means that uh, I'm, I'm just going to cease to exist, dust to dust. But that's not what takes place. And, and, and the most dire thing of that means that those individuals will never have an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then the third death is an eternal death. And that death, remember, is not only separated from the gracious countenance of God, but it is also separation to an eternal punishment in hell. And this brings forth our fourth contrast, which is this, Christ. Christ delivers us from a spiritual, physical, and eternal death. Christ is over death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And that is where we arrive at death in Adam and life in Christ. But as we look to verse 17, there's still more. And to grasp the full weight of yet another mighty, profound truth, let's go back to our summarizing statement, which we'll be covering next week, that there are two different reigns. There are two different Sovereign rules, a reign of sin and death and a reign of life and righteousness, a reign as a result of Christ's obedience and a reign as a result of Adam's disobedience. But this word reign, this word reign, the definition of it is a kingly or queenly rule, a kingly or queenly authority. And as we look to this verse, it is not only referring to Christ's kingly reign. It's directing us towards something else. Let me reread it. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness Reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Do you see what that verse says? He is not saying that we will exchange rulers who rule over us. He instead is saying that through Jesus Christ, we will be removed from being reigned over in sin and death. And we will become ourselves rulers. Rulers in life. Rulers in eternal life. 2 Timothy 2.12 If we endure, we will also reign with Him. Romans 8.16 and 17 The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified, glorified with Him on that day. Do you see the beauty of what has taken place in our life in Christ? What has taken place as a result of our justification. It is, as, it is as if we were paupers. Non-existent entities. Still dead in our sin. And it is as if the Lord, not only the great high king of the kingdom, but the great high king of the universe and everything in it. He took the time and he said, this one is mine. This individual I am adopting. I am bringing this pauper, this lowest of society into my eternal kingdom. And I am not only bringing them in, but I am making them. I am adopting you and I as sons and daughters. And it doesn't end there. 
with glorification. We enter into this eternal kingdom because of our justification. And we enter into the gates as princes and princesses of the great high king. And on that day, we become kings and we become queens that reign with Jesus Christ, with him as the most high king above all. This is literally too good to be true. And so wherever you may find yourself resting on this great truth that these afflictions are light and momentary, whatever you may be going through today, the worst of trials, the most challenging of seasons, we know that we have an eternal kingdom awaiting us. And this should lift up our spirits. These are the things that give us the solid framework. These are the things that give us the firm, solid foundation that doesn't break, that doesn't falter in the storms of life. These are the things that allow our roots to go, grow deep, to go and grow deep. So when these things come, we may hold fast. We may hold fast to what we have in Jesus Christ. Even events such as yesterday. We serve, we are sons and daughters one day to be kings and queens of Jesus Christ, the great king. And one day we will be seated with him on his throne, not from a sacrilegious standpoint, but to know that this is what awaits us, our inheritance. So wherever we're at today, we can hold fast to these truths. May his name be glorified, and may his name be magnified in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, what more is there to say? But Lord, there is so much to say. Words can't express the depths of the gift that you've given us. So may our response be the same. Where words can't express our gratitude and our thankfulness for this great treasure that you have given us. God, allow us to arise from the cloudy depths of our finite minds that just diffuse and belittle and don't make much of the glories and the riches that we have in our current life and that await us in our eternal life, Lord. But may we have eyes to see what awaits us. May we have eternity perpetually on our minds, Lord. And may that lift us up. And may we have the mindset to bring as many people along for this great glorious ride as you would see fit. May we be bold in our witness, Lord, and may we never again minimize, belittle the price that was paid, but may it be the gasoline for our engines each and every day, the glory and the joy of our salvation. May it be hearts, in our minds, and our souls. May Christ, you, be magnified in our lives.